Welcome to Innovating with Skydynamics. This is your host, Scott. And today I'm joined by Amir Elichai, who is the founder and CEO of Carbine. Well, welcome. Thank you very much. All right. So my understanding is that you um, spent some time in Israel's Ministry of Defense. Can you share a little bit about your work there? Yeah, sure. So after being officer for uh, five years uh, in the elite units in the Israeli Defense Forces, Basically, I uh, was appointed to work for the Israeli Ministry of Defense here in New York City, uh, mainly doing security operations for the Israeli ambassador and the Israeli consul general, uh, help them to be secured with all the threats are, that are around, um, uh, specifically here in New York City. Um, then I came back uh, to Israel and, and continued some work um, for the Ministry of Defense in Israel and abroad, uh, parallel to my studies in, in law and business school in Israel. Okay, so so defense, um, protection, emergency services, crises has so has been something that you are very familiar with to, thanks to your duty. Um, are there anything that you can share maybe as a kind of a story that you could share publicly in terms of how you've uh, managed a, a crisis? So it's not really a, a crisis in what you would think crisis is. It's not like natural disasters or something like that. But I think in general, serving uh, those agencies is, means being under pressure, uh, work fast, what they call the, in a very dynamic environment. Uh, so there is not something specifically that I can share which relates to a uh, crisis as you would think about it as coronavirus or earthquake or something like that. But it's a different, uh, different small event that might occur on a daily basis that you need to act and react uh, upon. So uh, nothing specific. Okay. Well, I think um, I'm going to come back to this, but this notion of time sensitivity and the ability to be able to respond on a real-time basis. Uh, so we'll come back to that in just a second. Uh, after your, your service, uh, you started something called Sky Project Holdings. Can you share a little bit about what that involved? Sure. So after the Army, as I said, I moved to New York and I uh, started to work and learn here. I, I started uh, my un undergrad studies here in NYU, and basically the idea was to leverage my connections, networks, and relationships in order to help Israeli entrepreneurs to raise funds for their, uh, for their different ventures. And they, um, the, the concept was, uh, when LinkedIn just started, basically to build a community of entrepreneurs who are looking for funds, on the other hand, to build a community for investors who are looking to invest in, in companies, and then doing smart match between those two. So basically kind of, uh, I would say, virtual investment banking firm. It was myself and a few other people that used to work for me. The idea was to help entrepreneurs to raise funds, and it was pretty successful. Okay. And was there a special kind of a stage or tranche that you typically focused on? Was it fairly early stage or was it more? Early stage. Okay, early so stage. very, very early stage. And, and the kinds of investors that you guys were working with, were they of Israeli background or were they just uh, – any investors that had a particular appetite for a certain sector? So um, it was mainly, I would say, Israelis or Jewish that either lived in Israel or are looking to invest in Israel because of the name of the startup nation, or people that don't have the reach to enough entrepreneurs and companies that basically approach us and, and, and used our services in order to find the right investment for them. Okay. So the, the reason we spent a little bit of, uh, f of a few minutes on your background is because it's very germane to what you're working on today, which is a startup called Carbine. Um, it, can you tell us a little bit about that and, and how it's helping to address the 911 landscape? Yeah. So after being in the industry and helping entrepreneurs to raise funds for their uh, different ventures, uh, I've been robbed in Tel Aviv Beach, um, and I tried to call emergency services, and you would expect the startup nation to have a good uh, response when you're calling to emergency services, but I found out that exactly like around the world, when you're calling to emergency services in Israel, they have no idea who is calling, where you're calling from, and why you're calling. 
So this is why I started car buying. Basically, I've been robbed in Tel Aviv Beach, and when I try to call them, they start to ask me for my name, where am I, what is happening around me? And I thought, how can I help emergency services in those essential situations to give the best response to citizens? So car buying today is a global leader uh, giving services to public safety agencies around the world. It's an ecosystem divided into few verticals. On the one hand, we are aggregating information, uh, as much information possible from either mobile devices, CCTVs, drones, automating cars, and we are source agnostic. So any information that we can aggregate um, on the one hand, delivering that information in a very smart and sophisticated infrastructure to emergency services. So when you're using Carbine, basically calling to 911, and Carbine is deployed in your county or city, immediately locate, your location will be shared through the operating system. And once the call arrives to the command and control, the piece of the command and control uh, center have the ability to send you a link or request and ask you if you would like to share more information with them. For example, live video, real-time chat, medical information, and more. And the idea is that we would like to give as much information possible for call takers in order to make their life easier to give you better response. So it's an ecosystem, aggregating data, analyzing it, and then distributing it to whoever wants to have this information. Wow. Oh. I wanted to go back to the, the incident at the beach because I'm just thinking, <clears throat> I don't know if you ever caught the person, but they clearly um, um, stole from the wrong person. I'm just thinking uh, there would have been incredible trouble if, they, if you had actually caught up with them. Yeah, no, so the, the story was that I was uh, with, with a lady uh, on the beach. Uh, it was like 7 p.m., so we were pretty alone on the beach, like a few other couples there. So um, there was three drunk uh, people that came to us and start to shout that they want to drink, if we have something to smoke, and we say, of course, we don't have it. And then I realized that something bad is going to happen, and you know, you cannot do anything actively because you are with a lady, and it's, it might be terrible if you will start to fight or try to run away or whatever. So in my personal instincts, what I did is basically said, uh, I will give you money and I would like you to go. And this is what I did. I basically gave them money that I had in my, my wallet and they was uh, smart enough or stupid enough to take it and they, they, they left. And immediately I called emergency services and this is what I did. And then all this story started. So this is what happened. Well, I think the, the takeaway there is if you're a gentleman, and you're, you're capable of taking care of yourself and, this, and that special other person, but you choose not to exercise that, that, that violence, uh, the, the lesson here is to just give them money and, 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 and pacify them. So pretty good strategy, I think. Um, coming back to the technology, I think basically what I'm understanding is that your local client, the app on the mobile phone, has a capability to tap into the various sensors, including audio, video, and other data that resides on the phone. And because it's an opt-in, um, when there's a push notification from the emergency services in 911, the user just simply has to accept, and then that gives them the permission to be able to access the, the native set of capabilities. Is, is that correct? Exactly. Exactly. Now, you mentioned, you mentioned medical uh, information as well. So are they filling out a questionnaire or is there just certain information that you are automatically able to access through the phone and then there are some things that you're able to then integrate through some other data sources? No, so we have integration into uh, other data sources and sometimes you have a medical application on your device. So if you are approving an access to Carbine in advance or uh, during the call, we have the capability to bring that information, or if you're using the Carbine mobile app, you have an ability to share uh, in your profile some of your medical conditions. So we have the ability to basically share it immediately. As an example, if you are a deaf person, of a person with speech disorder, okay, and you're calling to 911, okay, they cannot speak with you, okay, because you cannot hear. So in the Carbine C Now application, which is a mobile app that you have to download, you can 
write and, and mark that you are, uh, have speech disorder or a deaf person. And when you are calling through the Carbine platform, immediately they can see that you are a deaf person and then start to chat with you, like you're using your WhatsApp in, in a daily basis, okay? But it's absurd that in these days, if agencies that are not using Carbine and just trying, if you're calling, if you're a deaf person, you need to use special equipment called TTY that no one is using. So this is, uh, this is where we came from and, and there is, again, different ways in order to uh, uh, to get in to tap into your medical information. Now, um, of course, every nation and every 911 emergency services uh, in those domiciles or jurisdictions can be slightly different, but there is kind of this uh, very fragile time, this window, golden time of opportunity when certain crime or incidents happen. And if they're not able to respond on time or responsibly, there's going to be serious implications, including death and murder and so forth. So can you give us a few examples of how this would play out? And I think you mentioned COVID ID and how that's increased kind of a, a influx of inbound calls into 911 services. How does this help and how does it shrink as well as to address some of the underlying issues uh, that 911 has to deal with? Well, so this is, uh, this is a very good question and it's uh, there is many, many different applications. Okay, let's start from something that happened here in the US, Ocean County, uh, New Jersey. Uh, a father and, and his daughter uh, sailing a boat in the, in the ocean. Basically, uh, something happened to the boat and water are starting to uh, uh, get into the boat and the boat is starting to drop. Immediately, they are calling to 911. The call taker uh, had the carbine solutions. Immediately, they pinpoint their location, but also saw through the video the severity of the event, like how many waters are coming in and how immediate they need to respond. They saw that this is pretty bad and basically send immediately people to the exact location with the video to help the emergency services. The video also can share with the responders. So think about the massive event. There is 1,000 people. There is a call now about suspicious ob object, okay? You need to think that the call takers before using Carbon were totally blind. Suddenly they can see what is going on and this information can be shared with the emergency responders. So the emergency responder can see in real time the video coming from the citizens and can direct himself directly to the point and looking for the specific mm -hmm. object or person. We had an amazing event, a lot of events in Mexico that I will be happy to share with you afterwards, but um, we had an event that the family was kidnapped uh, on the way from Honduras to the United States. It was supposed to be delivered from Honduras to work in the United States. They were kidnapped by the Mexican cartels. They were locked in, a, in the suburbs of Mexico City. A lady that uh, part of the family found a phone. She called 911, Mexico City, who is our client found the, the immediately their location because of our partnership with Google. So we can immediately get the location through the operating system. They asked her, can you turn on the video? She said, yes. And then she showed them the apartment, how the people are, are standing mm -hmm. outside, what the, how the building looks like, where the entrances are, and they literally saved their lives. And the last thing that I will mention is that we are very proud that we have uh, helped few ladies to deliver babies. Um, so in uh, third world countries, people are living far away from hospitals. Suddenly, the, you know, the, 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 the lady is starting to give birth. They don't have enough time to drive to the hospital or sometimes they don't have the cars. So they're calling to 911. The paramedics on the health centers is turning on the video and giving the husband the instructions how to deliver the baby. And we had six like that in Mexico last year. So, and of course the ambulance is coming and, but parallel to that, they are giving the instructions. So basically I would say that giving the ability to see what is going on, helping emergency services dramatically. And as we are saying at Carbine, uh, one picture is thousand words. And we are saying uh, one live uh, streaming is better than thousand reports. So if you can see something that is happening, report about it, and then it basically makes the life of the 911 agencies much better. What happens in the case where the phone is not connected to a cellular service, 
uh, or that it is perhaps maybe several feet below the ground, uh, such as an underground parking lot uh, or some other remote locations. What happens then in those situations? It's a good question. So if you don't have anything, any kind of signals at all, okay, so you have no Wi-Fi, no cellular network, no voice capabilities, so nothing will work, right? So we have no magics to make it work. But let's assume that you are in an airplane mode or, as you said, underground uh, in a basement, but there is a Wi-Fi. So with the carbon solution, we are dividing the communication channels into two things. One is the voice path. The second thing is the data path, right? So if the voice is blocked, we have the mm -hmm. capabilities mm -hmm. to continue data session through the IP and convert it into a regular call. So we have few patents around it. And basically, we have the capability to leverage the IP network for communication with emergency services. Hmm. Gotcha. I understand. I understand. Uh, tell me about what happens after this particular event concludes. In, in other words, um, let's say that session ends. Do you still have a footprint into that device? Um, or they would have to opt in again? Opt in again. Okay. As long as they are not using our application, okay, and, and most of the people are not using, they're just calling 911, and then the web app starts, so they will have to opt in again every time. Got it. Uh, again, it's not leaving anything on the native device that can, you know, send signal back to your, your centralized cloud services, correct? Absolutely not. Okay. Now, I think one of the interesting thing about your solution is that instead of trying to invest into more infrastructure, which is usually the case for 911 and EMS types of services, you're utilizing the, the capabilities of what people have already, which in particular is the ubiquity of their phones. Um, how was that uh, perceived and, and what was the receptivity from the government agencies and the 911 emergencies that are your, essentially your customers? So our customers worldwide are very happy with the solution because I think like if you're looking five years ago, most of the governments was trying to launch mobile application and try to convince citizens to download application in order to better communicate with them. But immediately they realized that those mobile applications are not useful because people will not download an application if they're not using it on a daily basis or a weekly mm -hmm. basis. Okay? Mm -hmm. So having a solution that does not require the citizen to download anything. And basically the citizen is continue to do whatever he used to do, calling 911. And then the session starts. This was a big game changer for Carbine. This was the, 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 the biggest milestone that we have achieved. And um, what percentage would you say of your installments, uh, aside from the government channel, uh, are you seeing in terms of either the downloads on the consumer side or the end user? Uh, and the reason I ask is many SaaS strategy is instead of uh, enterprise sales, it's really allowing the individual SaaS subscriber to drive and push it up to the, uh, the enterprise decision. So we, we are not engaging with the citizens at all. Okay. So basically our sales team and our partners, distribution partners are only approaching governments and once the governments decided to uh, to acquire the carbon solution so immediately it's becoming available for all the people who are living within the jurisdiction and calling to this specific number so we have no approach of b2c uh, sale here we are directly to governments got it understood um, and in terms of your market uh, segments, uh, I know you guys are focused on 911 emergency calls. Are you guys looking to broaden that to uh, uh, go after other adjacent markets? And what would that look like? And then also talk about your product roadmap as well. Sure. So it, it depends in which countries, but we found out that there is uh, a lot of need for uh, for 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 the carbon services in different sectors, for example, private security companies, insurance companies, utility companies. So all those companies that needs to have the best real time communication that will work in any situation between citizens and their command and control can leverage the carbon platform. 
Okay, so, so far we did not approach those segments because we are really focusing on 911 agencies or 311 agencies like city, city communication. But maybe in the future, we will approach those. Okay. Um, my um, last two questions are going to be, there are other service providers that are targeting different segments entirely. So for example, uh, many of the, uh, the customer service components of large corporations, <clears throat> let's right. say I call into Apple, for example, remote access. And if I grant it, they have access to my desktop, my computers, my audio, everything. Um, so my question is, what is your defensibility given the fact that that use, that ability to be able to do remote uh, control uh, and access is very much readily available and others are already technically doing it, they just haven't focused into your use case? No, so first of all, specifically remote control is a totally different approach, but our main investment is not in the consumer side. Our main investment is what we call intelligent event management, which is the systems that the government are using on their premises. So we call it call handling solutions. It's a partnership that we have with Cisco and with some cloud providers basically to, to build the entire 911 infrastructure for the command control centers. And this is something that is not related to having the ability to do conferencing over web. Of it's course. much more complicated. It's much more sophisticated. The compliances, the regulation, how you're storing information. So there is a lot of things that we are doing and taking care of, which is basically the focus on the governments. On the mm -hmm. citizen side, I agree with you. You can also use WhatsApp to communicate in video, but make this accessible for emergency services is a totally different story. And this is why we have the entire ecosystem. Got it. Yeah. Good, great, good, great response. So my last question for you is uh, in terms of past product or project failures that you can share and, and kind of any, any type of lessons learned from that experience. So I will, I will uh, come back to uh, what you, you asked me before about the mobile applications and uh, uh, I would say better understanding your market. So when we started, we were launching our mobile app. Uh, we were falling in love with this mobile app and we thought that it's going to be 2 billion downloads in, in, in uh, five days. But in fact, it, uh, it, it was not the case. And I would say we started, uh, currently I'm, I'm living in New York, but before that I used to live in Israel. And I would say that you, if you are a, a young entrepreneur and you are developing something, uh, make sure that you are developing it in your target market. And because the behavior of people in Israel, Singapore, Philippines, Mexico, UK, and, and the US is totally different. And you need to learn very carefully what your client will be looking for and think out of the box and do not fall in love with what you're developing because maybe it's not the right thing. So I would say uh, uh, being on your target market and listen to your customers. Great advice. Uh, and with that, I've been joined by Amir uh, Eli Chai, who is the CEO of Carbine. Thanks for joining today. Thank you very much.